Hey guys, I'm back. Thank you for tuning in. I have some cool orchids to show off to you guys. Uh, nothing fancy or groundbreaking today. Just a casual little chit chat showing you guys some orchid blooms. But I'm really excited to get started. So let's go take a look. Up first, here is my Cygnotes Wine Delight Gem, which is, of course, a member of the Catacetnae Alliance. And Cygnotes is a nothogenus, which is basically just another word for like an intergeneric hybrid between Mormodes and Cygnotes. Cygnotes have these really nice, big, beautiful flowers. And out of all the Catacetnae orchids, I find Cygnotes to be one of the easiest ones to grow and to bloom. If you are new to Catacetnae orchids and you aren't sure where to start, I would recommend a Cygnotes as a good beginner Catacetum. On that note, I did a brief video about Catacetum culture, but I mainly discussed when to stop watering your Catacetum and how to bring it into winter dormancy, but I thought maybe my next Catacetum culture video, we would kind of uh, discuss the other side of that coin and talk about bringing them out of winter dormancy. So I plan on doing a good Catacetum culture video this spring when some of my Catacetums are waking up from their dormancy. So we'll definitely discuss Catacetum culture in more detail in the future, but in the meantime, if you have any questions or anything, there's plenty of information. Fred Clark's website's, of course, really good. But feel free to ask in the comments down below if you have a question about your catacetum's winter dormancy. Here is something really cool. This is a Pleurothallus. I love the foliage on this thing. It looks more like a philodendron or some kind of cool foliage plant than an orchid. I love orchids that have interesting foliage, so this one is no exception and I'm so happy to have it. And those cool little flowers are just an added bonus. It's sort of hard to get a good look at them on the camera, they're quite small. Maybe I'll insert a couple close-up pictures of it, but I am super stoked to have this. Uh, this Pleurothallus actually doesn't have a name yet. Uh, Pleurothallus is the second largest genus behind Bulbophyllums. There are so many different variations. I think there's something like 30 different subgenera under uh, Pleurothallus. Some of them are epiphytes, some of them are terrestrial, uh, different temperature ranges. They're just so diverse. So it's sort of hard to talk about the culture, uh, but most of them are pretty shady growing and they like a lot of water, a lot of humidity. But believe it or not, they can actually be quite easy growing if you have those couple parameters. They can grow and bloom almost constantly, a lot of them anyway, so very cool. I'm super happy to have this one. Uh, but like I was saying, this one doesn't have a name because Pleurothallus is such a huge diverse genus of orchids. They're constantly discovering, naming new ones, so this one uh, is nameless for now, but maybe one day when it is described, I'll find out the name and tag it. But until then, I'm super stoked to have it. Here's something cool. This is my newest orchid, brand new acquisition that I picked up last week. And it is this beautiful uh, bulldog type path. Bulldog paths are known for this kind of particular uh, shape. They just have these big, beautiful round, very heavy substance waxy flowers and they usually come in uh, these shades of sort of like maroon and burgundy and yellow. Uh, this one is called Path Ochilla Chilton cross Path Washington Creek Mount St. Helens. I got it from the Lyman Estate Greenhouse. Uh, it's a local greenhouse. Uh, I know the owner there. I filmed several videos there and she gets uh, really great stuff sometimes so that's where I picked this guy up. They're pretty easy growing, but they're just slow as all hell. They're called bulldog paths because one of the first hybrids in this line of breeding was named something bulldog, I believe. And now it's sort of just a shorthand for talking about this uh, type of path. I love it. I love the sort of uh, detail in the dorsal sepal here. It looks like a watercolor painting or something. It's really gorgeous. The flowers can last a very long time and paths in general are known for having pretty long lasting flowers, but I think the bulldog paths have the longest lasting flowers of them all. So 
very happy to have this. Hopefully I can get a few more slippers in the future now that I'm starting to get more into them, but this was a great addition to my collection. Up next here is a regular on my YouTube channel. Blooms pretty often off of every new growth. This is Brassavola nodosa cross Cattleya schilleriana, which was registered as Cattleya Mary Dodson, I believe. And it's this really cool kind of uh, primary hybrid between nodosa and schilleriana. And what I love about these kind of primary type hybrids is that they usually have pretty even distribution of like traits from both the parents. You can really see both the Schilleriana and the Nodosa. I really love this thing. It's very easy growing, just standard cat layer care. It's nice and fragrant. Uh, Nodosa is nighttime fragrant and so is this, uh, but I find it's kind of fragrant during the day too, maybe because of the Schilleriana in the parentage. Very cool, I love this one. I always seem to only get one growth on it and it always flowers, which is nice, but I'd like to maybe get more than uh, one growth and more than one spike. Uh, but it was repotted uh, not too, too long ago, so it's probably reestablishing itself and maybe it will give me a better bloom display next time. Here is a very cute Cattleya type called BCN Akas Aloha Dream Dust. And I was actually doing a bit of reading about this and I learned some things that I didn't know. BCN stands for Brassicathron. And the reason it gets that name is because it has something called Calarthron in its heritage, which is this really interesting looking Cattleya relative that I had never really heard of before. And I started reading about it. Um, not only are the flowers beautiful, but it's a pretty interesting plant. It actually has specialized pseudobulbs that allow for ants to live in them. They're sort of like hollow apparently which is so cool and interesting. Definitely gonna read up a bit on that. The flowers of that thing are really pretty and I can see the influence in this one here. So it's a very cool orchid, very pretty. Has a light kind of lemony fragrance, um, but the spotting is really beautiful and it's very easy growing too. Always blooms reliably, so very happy to have this one. And it's got that interesting parentage, which I'll have to look into a bit more. Here is something really cool that I wanted to give you a quick look at. I won't spend too much time talking about this because it's not even in flower right now, but it's super cool and I realized today that I hadn't shown it to you guys yet, so I thought we'd take a quick look. This here is my Dendrobium torace, which is this super cool miniature Dendrobium from Australia. And it's not in flower right now, but the foliage is so cool. Uh, the flowers are quite small, they're not very showy, uh, but they're neat and it's just a super cool plant overall. Those tiny leaves are so cool. I love the reddish tinge that the foliage gets when you give it bright light. They're just so cool. Um, I haven't had it very long, so I don't want to run my mouth about the culture until I've had a bit more experience growing it, but it is super cool and I just wanted to take a second to show you that cute little foliage. Last but not least, let's end on a high note with my Orangus biloba, which is a member of the Angrecoid Alliance hailing from West Africa. And like many other Angrecoids, it has these beautiful white nighttime fragrant flowers. Really cool. And the reason that it's called Orangus biloba is because the leaves have a bit of a bilobed appearance, as you can see here. You see a similar kind of foliage with a lot of the Orangus. Uh, here is my Orangus distincta. Just to show you another example of that kind of forked foliage, it's really pronounced on the distincta. That was one of the things that really drew me to it. It almost looks like a cool little staghorn fern or something. I love this thing so much. And I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the culture because I could actually do a whole video just about Angrecoid culture, and I plan on doing exactly that. So I don't wanna spoil that video yet, but uh, just to give you an idea, um, like I said, this is one of the easiest Orangus that you'll get. Um, definitely a great one to start out with. It likes kind of like foul level light, uh, maybe a bit more. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with Angrecoids 
We can be really tempted to overclock the light on our orchids. I know I do this. A lot of Cattleyas and Dendrobiums, you can really push the light and really get a ton of blooms and it's fun to do that. But with Angrecoids, there's actually sort of diminishing returns with light. You can definitely overdo it and it's better to stay on the safe side. I think watering is what most people have a hard time with and it is tricky. This is the reason why I want to do a whole video specifically about angrecoids because their culture is kind of nuanced and it just takes a bit more explanation, I think. Uh, but just to touch on water and humidity, most of the time humidity isn't essential for orchids. They'll appreciate some humidity. It's good for them. However, you can get away without it. But I would say it's definitely more important for something like an orangus, and here's why. They like to stay hydrated, but they like to dry out pretty well. So if you have very low humidity, your air is dry and it's sucking the moisture out of your plant. So you'd have to water more often. And a lot of the times that's fine. However, something like an orangus or a gray gum, you're gonna end up rotting the roots from having to overwater it. But if you have some humidity, it won't dry out as fast. You won't have the dry air sucking all the moisture out so you can get away with watering it a little bit less without the plant getting dehydrated. And then you'll have happy roots because they get lots of fresh air and they're not too wet all the time. So there's a few notes on angrecoid culture. Like I said, I'm doing a whole video about it. I'll probably do it soon too because it's been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, but hopefully that's some food for thought when it comes to Orangus biloba, and I hope I didn't make it sound more difficult than it is because this particular one is pretty forgiving as far as angrecoids go. And they're just the coolest. Look how pretty that is. I'm in love with this thing. Okay, I think that's enough out of me for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. I had fun uh, chatting about orchids and leave me a comment. Let me know what you guys are up to, what's new with your orchid collections, and we'll talk again soon. Um, also, show me some love and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I am almost at 800 subscribers, which is awesome. I'm so excited that you guys are still watching my videos. I've been doing this for over a year now, I think, and I still am having a great time. So thank you guys so much for that. And I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.